Welcome to Owen and Brew's Barbecue. Today we're cooking up something good. We're we're talking about the Mandalorian Chapter Five. So if you've if you've not watched this episode yet, uh, go ahead and skip all the spoilers because got some chefs in the in the house tonight. As as usual, I'm joined by by Nick and myself. I'm Matt, but but tonight we've got some somebody so special, nationally known, nationally known for his his podcasting cuisine. Uh, you know, connoisseur of, of sorts, maybe internationally known in some parts. And we're going to cook up some dewback ribs and perhaps a little bit of bantha bisque. So welcome Mike Bloom to the show. Uh, what's up, you womp rats? Wait, but I learned in this episode that apparently if you have a name to you, that makes you so much more, uh, I guess, uh, appealing than someone who is right there in front of you and should be taken for a certain amount of change. So maybe I'm the most dangerous part of the panel by proxy. And if that's the case, then I'm happy for this to be my last podcast. <laughs> First and last. Wow. Bold claim. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but you know what? I got my spurs. I'm walking in. Uh, both halves of me are here. My lower half is not, but that's that was safe for the post credit scene. But I'm ready to be talking about The Mandalorian. Uh, you guys have been doing some awesome coverage, and we're in like a weird sector of the Star Wars universe with this like live action serialized content. But it's been it's been very interesting. Yeah, um, it's uh, um not only have we have the live sh- live show, but we have the movie coming up. I, I keep looking at my podcasting calendar. I'm like, how am I going to fit Christmas in here? Mm. Um, <laughs> and Life Day, <laughs> and Life Day, which is come and gone. Yes. Uh, yeah, back in back in Thanksgiving. But uh, yeah, this. Uh, so you've enjoyed the the show so far, Mike. I just your your take up to this point, and maybe you, you can even excuse yourself from this episode if you want to just kind of talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, I'm I'm going to preface this, and hopefully this does not, you know, uh, mean really mean that this is this cement my status further as this being uh, the death of my podcasting career in this podcast. But I'm going to use a swear word, probably within the Star Wars universe. I'm going to use the term Star Trek a bit. I'm going to be throwing it around, okay? Because to be candid, what I've sort of been gleaning from both this and stuff like Star Trek Discovery is that. Star Trek today very much resembles Star Wars, and The Mandalorian is really the most Star Trek that Star Wars has been. Uh, Mm. And I think the medium definitely helps. I think that obviously, uh, you know, the way that I've looked at the franchise is, is that Star Wars is more so known for, you know, epic, grandiose set pieces, big battles. I mean, it very much embodies this idea of a space opera where it's really high highs and big feelings that we're hitting. Star Trek is more of a like smaller philosophical show. I, I, we often think of it as, you know, looking at the problems of today through the lens of tomorrow. Right. Uh, and so I think that, you know, those have kind of flip-flopped over the past couple of years or so in that Star Trek has sort of now been, due to technology, been able to take on these like bigger more action set pieces because they're not too worried about budget, whereas Star Wars and The Mandalorian has been able to really say, okay, we're going to have an episode that's going to have a really simple beginning, middle, and end, and then we move on to the next thing. And from that regard, as a Star Trek fan and a Star Wars fan, I've really enjoyed The Mandalorian. Uh, was this particular episode the best one? Maybe it was fine. Uh, I think in comparison to the rest, it was fine. Uh, I think it was a pretty simplistic plot, but I think it's, you know bringing things back to one of the mainstays, one of the big planets that has been part of the canon since the very beginning. And so that was a lot of fun. Obviously bringing back possibly some mainstays as well. Uh, And I think that, you know, I've been intrigued and invigorated by it because I I really like the change of pace. I don't necessarily need uh, the tone we get in a Star Wars film where it really does feel like we are going from place to place with us with a wipe away. Uh, this really feels mm-hmm. like it's taking its time. <clears throat> and I personally enjoy that. And as someone who likes to live in those moments, uh, even when they're not the most pulse pounding, I think they're still really interesting moments nonetheless. That's a great takedown. Uh, Nick, you and I haven't talked about this episode at all. I mean, not at all. No. Uh, yeah. So I was kind of curious as to to your take on on this episode being um one one of the the most famous nitpickers. So, and uh 
Might yeah. I also point out that this is the first time that the trilogy of HBO podcasters on the J and J come together. Right, right. We, we have Westeros and Westworld as well as uh, uh, Leftovers uh, with um, Mike, and and now I've I've been able to do Watch Watchmen. So yeah, a good episode last night too. H- HBO amigos here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I liked the episode. I think this was the first episode where I felt it actually hurt um, being in the half hour format instead of an hour format. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. Um, because I felt the whole uh, um, what's I can't remember her name. Uh, oh, the the uh, mechanic. Panic- Finish. Oh, 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 uh, oh yeah, Amy, Amy, Amy Sedaris's character. Amy Sedaris's character. Yeah. I felt like that was a bit drawn out and lagged. And then when you got to the parts that you really wanted to see or the, or the build up, it kind of just nipped it in the bud really quick. And you're like, oh, because um, um, I don't want to get. I don't we, we can we can jump into whatever. I, I mean, we have no. Well, you're saying I, what I thought of it. I just mm-hmm. kind of felt because uh, I really because you know the, the episode draws from the John Wayne movie, The Searchers, <clears throat> and. I felt that you could have gone with almost a three ten to Yuma uh, part with uh, Ming Na Win. I think it's how you say her name, the mm-hmm. actress. Uh, with that character, because like they build up, like she was you know the most you know one of the best assassins you know for the Huts and all these things. Like you go after her, you're going to pay the you know a price for it. You could have gone like with this whole how clever, how good is she? Like, does she escape from them? Does she like, does like, uh, instead of having, um, the sand people be civilized almost, what if they attack them in the middle of the night while she's hostage and she kills them while they're sleeping or something like show just how well, she killed the men and the women and the children of the, them them too, them too. yeah, just rage. I, mean, I just kind of felt like there were, there's like a missed opportunity to show, how cool this character could have been instead of just like the quick, like, Oh, we captured her and boom, she's dead. And- yeah. I think that's an interesting point. Cause I think, yeah, the Fennec Shand character uh, who was this sort of like big, bad mercenary, it, it's, it's almost like she was used more so as like, uh, as like a, a plot point than mm-hmm. an actual character where the most we saw of her was like her shooting a sniper rifle. Right. For, like at the time yeah. she was on, I wonder. It was, the only- it was weird because I was actually rooting for her. <laughs> in a way you yeah. kind of well, do yeah it's only because toro calican is like a little asshole right we'll right, certainly right. get into that uh but i think that m- maybe the one thing i could think about in terms of this intention is you know they said that fennec you know was a, a big mercenary for people from the that were you know servicing under the empire uh including the huts and so i wonder if maybe she sort of represents like what does life look like for some of these people now that the empire has fallen you know she's not exactly the the stormtrooper helmet on the pike uh but she's mm-hmm. gonna become one by the end so maybe it's more so saying like hey even these big bad people who were feared so much uh during the rebels fight are now sort of like a dying breed and now this is the age of the Mandalorian and these other bounty hunters to sort of pick up the pieces that the Empire left behind and try to build their own careers from it. But yeah, I would agree that it would have been nice to have. I mean, it's played by uh, like an MCU adjacent actress, for God's mm-hmm. sake. Like, I, w- I want to see something <laughs> more from that. Yeah, I, I wanted to see more with her character. And, uh, you, you know, maybe maybe even to Nick's point, like, you know, whether or not it's a half an hour or 40 minutes or however much they, they give us. You know, I could almost so far the the series because now that we're up to chapter five, it, it really feels like the first three episodes could have been the pilot. It could right. have been the movie pilot, mm-hmm. and episode or chapter four and chapter five have been this like serialized like and on to the next adventure. Which which goes to your point, Mike, about the the Star Trek aspect of it, right? right. You know, it's just kind of like I mean, we hear that adventure theme come in, and we're like, and he's off like to another mm-hmm. planet, you know, like. Um, what's, what's, what's Al and, you know, um, Ziggy going to get into I'm trying to think of, like, <laughs> like it kind of reminds me of quantum leap in that aspect. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, um, it, with, with these, with these Western or samurai kind of stories kind of like woven into, into the, the weekly episodic aspect. Um, it also kind of reminds me of, of how the cartoons, uh, for, for those, season one of, of Clone Wars, season one of Rebels, like they seem very simplistic and they're really trying to grab kind of the broadest range of mm. uh, like viewers with some of their episodic aspects. But as those shows went on, 
they really built upon their own language and those season two, season three of those shows really kind of grew. And so I, I have hopes that season two and maybe, you know, a season three would be more nuanced than what we're getting with, with these so-called filler episodes. Right. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you're, yeah, I think you're right in suggesting that like it casts a wide net. And I wonder if it's because it, it is, you know, a big step in terms of everything we know from Star Wars in terms of the medium that they would try to go for it. But I mean, one of the things that I've enjoyed about it is the fact that it doesn't feel like it's really like, obviously, you have the baby Yoda stuff, but like, mm-hmm. it doesn't feel that inextricably tied into the Skywalker saga. I mean, until the, the post credit seed, which we may get into. But uh, what I personally have liked about that and something that I unfortunately haven't enjoyed too, too much, not too, too much, but I would say uh, something uh, that has not been my favorite thing about, you know, the, the seven and eight and nine of it all is I'm actually not a huge fan of like bringing in older characters because uh, it feels like, you know, it, it feels like. I could understand that you're like, hey, we want to bring in these people to like bolster fans' interest so that this can hopefully prop up the other characters. But oftentimes it does the exact opposite in that it's like, hey, I want to see, I want to see Luke and Leia. I want to see Han. I don't, who is Ray? I don't really, I don't, I don't want to see her. Get back to, you know, Han and Chewie flying in the Falcon. Uh, and then and the, on the, at worst, it comes off almost like fan service of like, hey, we want to appeal right. to these people. So we're just putting them in there. And what I've really enjoyed is that they've been able to take their time and really like separate themselves. I mean, you guys have pointed out some like fun references and Easter eggs that have been made, but it's not like, oh, and now they're going to uh, run into, uh, I guess I'm trying to figure out like who would be canonically alive at this point you know like oh they're gonna go to endor and oh no he's gonna he's gonna fade with the ear with the ewoks what's going to happen like that would feel a bit too much like they're trying to cash in on something whereas this felt like it's really going out on a limb uh though again where this is the episode where we go back to tatooine <laughs> they, and that is true. Yeah. References. it is it is probably the most heavy referenced with with some of those but but to your point mike i do think that a lot of the show so far um Maybe maybe it's the fact that you don't have to know a lot of all of these references. Like, yeah. you know, it's all it's all there. You know, like you can be kind of a mild Star Wars fan. And um, my my sister, um, who's who's younger than me, like even she's kind of like taken in by this show. And it's it's she doesn't have to know all of the the little nuggets of of stuff, but she knows like, oh yeah, that is the cantina. Like mm-hmm. you know, it's like she gets those basic references. Like she doesn't have to know like, um, like oh this one scene or the fact that uh, uh, the the Pelly character mentions carbon scoring and like oh yeah Luke mentioned carbon scoring. That's a thing, you know. It's like like those I think are there for the fans, but the show at least at least is servicing kind of the general fan. Yeah. where it's not like too too highfalutin. Uh, there was a there was a lot of fan service in this one. It wasn't beat you over the head with it, but it, it it I think it was probably the heaviest episode that had a lot of references in it. I mean, even just visual references as well. Yeah, because um, I wrote down six of them from what I wrote. Like you know, the first one you see is you know the, the just the rock outcropping of a new hope. You know when mm. Luke and, and uh, Obi Wan are there, you know, saying most likely you'll never find a more you know place of scum and villainy and all that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the, the docking bay, even though it's a different number, looks exactly the same that the Millennium Falcons in a new hope. Um, the pit droids, of course, from episode one, uh, mm-hmm. carbon, score, uh, carbon scoring, as you said, Matt, and then she even calls him a womp rat after he's yep. walking away. Um, the wreckage outside the cantina is exactly the yes. same. Uh, they can't, they can't oh, clean this up over 30 years. They're just, yeah, like, yeah just, eh, like, just leave it there. Yeah. yeah. That scrap metal's not working. I mean, you would think that the cantina has changed ownership once more. <laughs> all droid management, you would think they would like be able to invest in some hired help to move that wreckage away. But I guess maybe now it's like part of the aesthetic. What I what I yeah. <laughs> what I liked best about the cantina scene though was um it was fan service, but it was a, done in a in very neat way in that it's it shot for shot exactly from A New Hope, as in the way that he walks in, mm-hmm. when he walks into the entrance. But the first thing you notice that's different is the droid detector is not there. Right. And so that... Yeah, there, there is, there's a droid, like, bustling around. I mean, one's behind the bar, obviously. So clearly, clearly they've... Old management, uh, they were too... Uh, they, they were too discriminatory. They decided to drop <laughs> right. those policies in recent years. 
Uh, well, that's, I mean, it was kind of odd. Like you see, like, oh wow, you went from we don't serve their kind to yeah. all of a sudden it's all droids. And I mean, there's a few things in there, but you wonder like is now it's a, truly a dive bar that you know, there wasn't that many creatures there. It's like, do oh, you, what happened? Do you think the droids got rid of the band? Do you think they were the ones that like we don't need house music? <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, good point. No, that's a, that's a fair point. I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I, again, I, uh, this goes against what I just said about the fan service at all, but God, did I miss that cantina music? That was, that's always been a delight to me. <laughs> they, they couldn't afford it. You know, they were, that's true. They were pricey. <laughs> Even though they cleaned up the cantina, there was still like a fly creature there. So but what, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I noticed yeah. it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um I, Nick, I had kind of a similar list of all of the references. You, you had R five D four, the stormtrooper helmets, mm-hmm. uh, mention of uh, Mos Espa, uh, mention of Boat Beggars Canyon, mention mm-hmm. of the Dune Sea. We get uh, Sabak cards, Tuscan Raiders, Dubaks. It's it's all in this episode. The only one thing that I wasn't sure about was the speeders that he got. Those looked to me exactly the same one that Anakin rides in Episode two, but I couldn't confirm it. I I just watched episode two actually a couple nights ago because actually Nick you inspired me of like all right let me remember if it's really that bad it's it's really that bad uh, <laughs> I don't know if it was the same they, it, okay. they it has more of a I think the one Anakin rides is a little bit more swoop and yeah swoop. exactly this one yeah. seems more like actually like the the ones the stormtroopers ride in like Return of the Jedi on Endor right where it's just very bare bones like bar and bar <laughs> handlebar <laughs> yeah yeah it definitely had that that imperial influence at least um and uh the um the so we have the cantina scene we also have uh the introduction of this toro calican Cal, calican um which is sitting in in han solo's you know seat even with his foot propped up why is there no McClunky reference? Or I guess this was filmed. <laughs> this was filmed before, before that, like the, before the internet realized it, right? So I guess no. look forward to a season two McClunky reference for sure. I, yeah, no, I think you're calling your shot right there. So I, I guess the new ownership might like, wouldn't there be like a blaster burn behind the head yeah, exactly. right there? You know, it something? looks like they cleaned, like they actually painted, or you know, at least did a paint job. So, but, um. Yeah, I, I really was not expecting us to go to Tatooine. I know that the, the promo posters of The Mandalorian had uh, reference to Tatooine. I just was not kind of expecting it. So when it happened, I was like, oh. And there was that part, fan part of me that was like, oh. Um, but then there was also that part of me that was like, well, this is what we're doing. Like, let, <laughs> let's see what you got, you know? And uh, um, I, I liked the setup of the action sequence, the fact that they... When they finally get out beyond the Dune Sea, I know I'm skipping over the the whole offer, um, but uh, when when we finally get out there, though, just that whole setup of the fact that they have to wait till night. She's, mm-hmm. in, a, she's in the high. She has the high ground. Um, oh yeah, we also get that reference. Um, yeah, yeah. The she's oh, my- so good to me dead. Oh, go ahead. this is this is like I was saying. This is the searchers. Like that whole part there once he enters the cantina until they capture is a uh, homage to the John mm. Wayne film, the searchers. Cause that's, what's about John Wayne's the old uh, sheriff or, you know, like law, you know, and he's teaching the young cocky kid. He really doesn't know anything. And even the night shots are based upon that. On huh, the, searchers. Okay. the searchers has a beautiful night shots, especially for its day. I mean, it's just, and that's, you could tell that that was copied um, to make mm. it that way. Hmm. I like the uh, the practicing of the the, the gun slinging, the, the <laughs> shot of the gun slinging. Right. Yeah, that's the thing is that you know I think we all sort of knew what Toro was, what's going to happen with Toro <laughs> once he got once he he thought when he was going to sit with Fennec, either like Fennec was going to trick him or mm-hmm. Fennec was going to convince him, like no, 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 I'm not. Uh, this is not the person you're looking for. Yeah, um, <laughs> and he sort of gets like he got sort of gets mind tricked here. Uh, but you know, I think that. It was an interesting character, though, too, because I guess what it, this episode did was sort of, I guess, set up sort of a, a hierarchy or maybe just sort of like uh, guidelines behind the guild or mm-hmm. sort of, you know, what does it look like from the perspective of someone who's on the outside looking in and is looking to, you know, and the Mandalorian who is sort of had to serve as like a mentor role. 
whereas like some with Kara Dune, it felt like more of as like a partnership where it felt yeah. like they were both so confident in their abilities. It's clear from the jump that Mando does not trust this guy whatsoever. And it's vice versa, considering that Toro smashes that fob uh, oh, you know, yeah. as, as soon as he agrees to the deal. So that was an interesting dynamic, at least. And if anything presented us new information about Mando, it's that at least we can sort of see he while he does have this literal hardened persona uh there are certain things that he's able to open up to we obviously saw the relationship with the child and now it does seem like at least he used to be up for you know being an advisor maybe now he's not going to be trusting of literally anybody from the guild uh because now the information has really been out about what he did there but it shows that he was at least willing to do so let's talk about his trust or relationship with the child though what kind of what kind of guy leaves a baby on yeah. a ship to go to a bar. I mean, it's just bad. That's just bad uh, parenting right there. It, this is this is where you can clearly see the 70s influence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's not only just, like, the action sequence, like, bam, 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 on to the next thing. It's it's the, you know, uh, throwing kids into to basically a locked room and saying, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah they just got to go drink, you know. I mean, I know you have a little baby Yoda of your own. Yeah. Maybe not 50 years old, but. Uh. Well, listen, he was he was also born on May 4th. So I feel like this is like this. He is the one. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know what side he's going to fall to, but I feel like that's significant. Uh, but yeah. Oh, if I did that. Uh, yeah. Child services would be called on me. And I guess child services is served here in the form of Pelly. And that yes. she like, I mean, even though she more so manipulates it for financial gain, uh, she's less so about like the, oh my God, he's a horrible parent and more so like, what is this thing? How can I use this to get more money? Mm-hmm. Uh, what what did you guys think of Amy Sedaris, by the way? Never in a million years would I ever thought that Amy Sedaris would show up on a Star Wars project. Right? Yeah. I had mixed reactions. I mean, unless you want to go first, Matt. Um, no, I, you, I mean... You- I mean, she did her role, but I, it, to me, this was the only scene I've seen so far in this series that felt like if there would have been a 1970s Star Wars show, this was it. Because it was mm. kind of, it just kind of felt off to me, like just the way that it was, and and uh, some of the lines were kind of I felt forced, it's just awkward. I don't know. I mean, I didn't yeah. hate it. I didn't. I'm not trying to be negative. It's just kind of how I felt. With, I've only watched it the one time. Mm. Uh, but I remember just kind of going, okay, and it just it dragged out a little bit. Like I said, that's mm-hmm. what made me kind of think this is hurt by the half hour format is that you spent so much time her going like, you know, oh fine, you don't want droids. Oh look at this thing, it's gonna, you know, it's a wreck, and like he's, right. and then like I'm gonna charge him extra to watch you, and it's like, is it really? Is this all this necessary? You know, like I just kind of I wanted to move on. <clears throat> I I do wonder like how hard it is to act against Mando's helmet. True. Like I mean that's. You know, every every comedian or actor that's been on this show so far, you know, I mean, that's that's a that's a bit of a, you know, I mean, you're you're kind of having to do a lot of the heavy lifting there. I um, I've always liked Amy Sedaris. So so once I heard her voice, I was like, wait, I had to keep doing double takes like I was like, yeah, because the, the way they did her makeup. Her hair reminds me. Well, I was going to say, it didn't help that she had like Ripley hair and no eyebrows. Right. (laughs) Ripley hair. She kept reminding me of Ripley the entire time. I was like, this is what would have happened to Ripley if if she would have landed in the Star Wars universe. So that that curly, curly hair. Um, Yeah, I I agree with you. Those, those scenes, those scenes felt a little clunky. I thought some of them worked a little bit better than others. Some things kind of just kept felt a little shoehorned in like some of the dialogue like oh and now now i'm going to mention motivator now i'm going to mention this this thing you know um i i did like the relationship to her pit droids and the mm-hmm. fact that she asked yeah. them a question and all three of them have a different answer like you know one of them's like no don't do it he shot at me one of them's like yes one of them's like i don't know so <laughs> it's almost like it is in episode one i think you know with just them having their own personalities you know like three stooges very you know mm-hmm. and uh and they're playing sabak as well um, right you know, i noticed yeah. that you know with her yeah for me yeah it felt i mean i love amy sedaris as well it was also really weird because i you know the first part of the last season of bojack horseman came out like a month or so ago so oh, like yes. I was able to recognize her voice, but you can't place it. Because, again, it doesn't look like Amy Sedaris. So I think we also remember her from, like, Jerry Blank from Strangers mm-hmm. with Candy, where, like, she doesn't even look like her. She looks like a very specific person. But, yeah, yeah this felt, like, this felt very sticky to me. It felt like some of, like, the... I wouldn't say it's veering on the level of Jar Jar, but it feels like in those type of things where, like, they are really going for 
broad comedy and Amy mm-hmm. Sedaris is really selling it, but it doesn't necessarily butt up. It sort of butts up against like the tone yeah. of the rest of it. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's, it's interesting that we spent so much time with her. Maybe it's because they had that big name that they really wanted to use her, but I was surprised that she was such a prominent part of it and even more surprised that like, I don't know. I, I'm very intrigued that I guess it's part of the serialized format that you have these characters that have been like announced as casting, but they seem to be one and done. You know, unless we have like a big battle in episode eight where suddenly, you know, here comes uh, here, here comes Gina Carano and here comes Amy Sedaris. They're all going to come in and like support yeah, him. And it's very calls, interesting. Yeah, yeah, he calls in all of his favors. He's like, yeah, yeah exactly. Like a, a Facebook messenger. And he's like, come on, guys, I need you. Yeah. So it's just interesting that we have like these one time guest stars when you think again that like, oh, this is going to be. Uh, you know, his crew, as it were, but he's going alone. I would also say, again, going back to Star Trek, uh, mm-hmm. people who watch Star Trek Discovery, uh, Tig Notaro played a character in the most recent season called Jet Reno, and it's very similar to, uh, a little, again, a little more dry, a little less sticky, but a very similar to uh, to Peli Moto here, in that they're both like the wisecracking grease monkey type. Uh, so I very much felt like, again, echoes of a lot of different stuff from hmm. basically all space tr- space based pop culture uh, on this screen today. No, no, that's a, that's a great connection for for a show that I have not yet dove into. Part of it is because I don't I don't have the CBS. Mm. App, so. See, that's the thing. It's yeah, it's a it's a little bit of like a gateway. I'm trying to think if like. I'm sure it has to be. I'm, I mean, if you have a VPN, I think it's on Netflix Canada. I believe so. Uh, so that's. I mean, it's pretty awesome. So the second season, particularly, has a, is really really interesting. So I heavily I give it two thumbs up. And I, I mean, obviously, we have Picard coming out next month, which is going yes. to be bananas, and I'm so excited for it. <laughs> and and a very memeable character too. I'm I'm kind of wondering, like, where are the Picard, Baby Yoda? Like what's what's a more memeable kind of thing yeah because I mean Picard was sort of like I mean he was able to be brought into meme culture between the face palm and the uh and all right. these other faces he's able to make but Baby Yoda I mean the internet is is re- it's really the Venn diagram of like what the internet obsesses over so I don't know if that if an old British Patrick Stewart can overpower Baby Yoda, unless we don't know what's happening to Baby Yoda. You know, I don't think we're going to kill him off after eight episodes, but like mm-hmm. if he morphs into like awkward, gawky teenage Yoda, does, is that going to change things in terms of his marketability? I think it comes down to when he finally speaks. Mm, yeah, what's his like, first word going to be? What's the first word? Like, you know, is he going to be speak like Yoda? Is he going to speak his own? Is he going to be a cute baby voice or is he going to be like some deep, like, hey, bud, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. So obviously Yaddle is like the big connection to Baby Yoda, right? Did did Yaddle speak in the prequels? I don't think don't Yaddle think so. spoke. Okay, because I was going to say, like, if Yaddle spoke and it sounds like Yaddle, then I guess the connection's there. But maybe they could invent a voice for Yaddle and, like, do a re-re-edit of the prequels and put <laughs> Yaddle's voice in there. <laughs> she just says, come hither. And it cuts to, like, a door closing. I don't know. She's talking yeah. to Yoda. Um, anyway, that's, that's why. I'm planting the seed. The Yoda seed. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I need to move on from this. <laughs> um. Anyway, uh, so okay, what is your take though, Baby Yoda? Like, Baby Yoda lasts into season two. Baby Yoda's here to stay. Like, or yeah, I think Baby Yoda's here to stay because I think uh, they were counting on it, and I mean, like, that is the thing that's been advertised. Right? It's yeah. been like. Like it's been had universal appeal by far the most universally appealing Star Wars character, even past anybody in uh, the seven, eight, nine of it all. So I feel mm-hmm. like it, like it just supersedes anything because of its uh, attractiveness from a cuteness perspective. And so I, I feel like it absolutely is here to stay. It depends on how much, you know, I would not be surprised, honestly, if we have like a baby Yoda in the fray of battle with Mando by the end of the season. And so it becomes Mm. less of like a parent taking care of a child and more so like a partnership. And maybe that's sort of the tone they take on in season two and how they put this more front and center. But yeah, that thing is not going anywhere anytime soon considering it's uh, it's corporate overlords. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, that would, that would, that would serve kind of what, you know, Nick, I know you, you had mentioned it. We had talked about it before uh, the the Wolf and Cart um, series, you know, and that idea of, of you having this this uh, kind of baby warrior or this child warrior, you know, or, or child assassin. So, um, 
Yeah, it's um, one one other thing that I wanted to to do before you know, since we're talking about baby baby Yoda and all of the merchandising involved with baby Yoda, because you can't buy anything. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and put a commercial break in this show right here. Cause that's what we do uh, when we need to sell some baby Yoda. And we can come back. Ooh, all that baby Yoda. I mean, I think one of the, the, the true appeals to baby Yoda is not just the fact that it's a baby Yoda. It's the, the facial expressions of that puppet slash CGI are just mm. spot on every time. And it's relatable because like everything that it's, that baby Yoda has done, it's very human, you know, in that, you know, like him flipping on the switches, you know, him, you know, him telling the child to stay and then it's right there beside him. He's like, fine, let's go. You know, it's just like, there's so many things that people get that. I think that's what often, Move, you know, movie magic or whatever is just it's the simplicities of things like mm. that that people aren't thinking about when they write it. They're like, oh, well, that's just something it would do, but that that's what people actually resonate with. Yeah, it's it's a really well designed character, and I I wonder also if because it's younger, and this I guess goes back to like the cartoon aspect of it, like embellishing the features also helps like the fact that it has these giant ears and the fact that it mm-hmm. has like more bigger childlike eyes uh, allows for those types of expressions that I think allows people to connect with them more, especially when it's opposite a guy who has literally no expression. <laughs> no, that's, that's a, that's a fair point. Right. My, my big, yeah. my big worry though, just with the, the series um, is long-term and the fact that is every season or every episode going to end with baby Yoda's in danger um, and then you have, um, do we have another, another person joining us in here? Oh, we do. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. We have, we have a, a, a guest here. Can't uh, get rid of me that easily, jerks. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have our roving reporter, uh, Chris. Welcome to the barbecue. Thanks, man. I, I, I want to take the opportunity. I am at work, so I can't speak for too long, but I want to take the chance because I saw it in my messenger. I, I had an opportunity to interrupt you, sons of bitches, and I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> I thought we left you in the Dune Sea. We shot you and everything. <laughs> Mike, shut your mouth. You're, you're you're replacing me this week. I hope I hope I hope you're doing a great job by interrupting Nick as as much as you possibly can. Yeah, and I was talking about all the time how great Keith David was on this show, or who was it? Was it uh, <laughs> Lou Gossett Jr.? I think I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. Uh, Iron Eagle, buddy. Iron Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Hey, so um, I'm going to throw my crazy crackpot theory out there. Um, I don't have one, but I, oh. I think the boots are Bill Burr. I don't, I don't think the boots were anybody who are is being, you know, uh, people are talking on the, on the Internet that think it's Boba Fett. I think it's BS. I think it's Bill Burr. Okay. I, That's I, what I'm going to leave you with. All right. I got to go back to work. I just want to be annoying pest. I, and, uh, I saw my message pop up. The link. So <laughs> here I am. And here Pre- I go. All right, see, Chris. <laughs> Appreciate it, Chris. We haven't actually gotten into that yet. Yeah, um, we haven't gotten into that little post, like a true to Disney owned property fashion, the like big twist in the mid credit scene. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, let's let's do that. Um now I think isn't Chris referring to the Aftermath series? Um who actually owns Boba Fett's armor? Who actually owns Boba Well, we don't know. We don't know who owns Boba Fett's ar- armor. I thought we did. So. Um okay. but I mean that's that's what it's leading you to believe because Boba Fett does have spurs. Mm-hmm. Right. And, so, and we hear the spur noise coming. And out. I mean the last time we saw him was on Tatooine. Granted, it was in the stomach of the Sarlacc, but mm-hmm. I don't out know. Maybe. Beyond the Dune Sea. Yeah. So the Dune Sea is where the, the Sarlacc pit would maybe a hundred years just went by super quick, you know? <laughs> he got digested and then he just popped right out and he's ready to go again. Yeah. All that metal just doesn't doesn't maybe. corrode. Well, okay, so here's here's one other aspect of the character that comes up to um to Fennec uh, is that that character has a fob on them. So, mm. and I kept wondering like, okay, was it the first bounty hunter that was like on the do back um, with its, with its leg up in the, uh, the, you know, do backs harness or whatever and being drugged, you know, like was, was that bounty hunter really dead? And cause they had the fob on them um, still going. Um, but 
when I went back to that scene, I paused it and that character that, that does lean down, they have kind of like yellow boots or some brighter color boots because mm. I kept thinking like, was it Mando that went back? Like who went back for mm. Fennec? Um, and what yeah. would they want with Fennec with a dead mercenary unless they have the ability to resuscitate her, clone her? I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, what, I mean was, the, was the job specifically to bring her in alive? Because that's what you wonder. Like, you wonder if it was a dead or alive bounty. Because I mean, you might still get some money out of it if it. He says she's no good to me dead. Mm, so true. it makes you wonder. Like, is but the, the, the idea though that they're checking her pulse or, or checking to see if she's alive, like, kind of makes you wonder. Like, was that the last? But how did she survive a point blank range? Yeah, shot to the gut, essentially. So, yeah, like she, she could, I don't think she'd be playing possum for that long, where she'd be sitting out there all. Because remember, she got shot, shot at sunrise, right? And then it's very clearly dark. Both suns have gone down, so you can't imagine she'd like. All right, it's been twelve hours. I think I'm okay <laughs> now. I can finally get up. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Um, but yeah, I mean, Boba would be the only reason why I would be interested in it being Boba is that you know, obviously. The Fets have sort of uh, appropriated the Mandalorian armor. You know, I think the Mandalore would not consider them Mandalorians, just sort of like hired guns, uh, but they appropriate them. And so it would be interesting for someone as devout as Mando, as you sort of talked about, Nick, sort of being like an orthodox Mandalorian in terms of his, his you know, belief system up against someone who's sort of like, you know, using the, their armor against them it it would be an interesting conflict but i don't know if we want to undo essentially all the stuff uh that happened to boba fett to you know see that showdown happen right yeah i'm i i I have a hard time believing that they're going to bring boba fett into the show yeah I, i think there's a lot of people that that want it to happen or would like it to happen i i don't know i mean do you do you think it's boba fett mike I I don't think it is, and okay. it's it's only. I mean, I know that like we're cover- you guys are covering shows like Watchmen, where it's just like it's not this thing, but it definitely is this thing. <laughs> but I did see an interview with John Favreau where he was like adamant, saying that like no, these are all new characters. Right? Showrunners have lied to us in the past, but I don't know if they would like want to do something big like this like you said i mean boba fett would be some big fan service but like we've talked about up until this episode they've done a great job of really not necessarily needing to prop themselves up on the characters we know and love from previous star wars installments Mm -hmm. this would just feel like a step back in doing that you know i i was i almost felt like it was a step back for the fan service of tatooine Mm, that's true as well i was i was a little like kind of like like i said um, I think the part that that got me as far as like got me excited about this episode was when we start seeing them fly off on speeders. I'm like, okay, this just got interesting. Like, you know, seeing speeder bikes flying in the dead. It, it just looks like something I would have done with my toys as a kid. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, I like that whole scene. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because you, the whole strategy of you know just, uh, firing off the flares to blind her, and I was mm-hmm. like, oh, that, that's cool. I mean, it's a nice strategy that it's believable. Yeah. And know? it's and it gets a nice callback where like he hangs on to one and uses that against uh, Toro as well mm-hmm. to distract him before he like flat out shoots him. Just yeah. kills them right there, you know, point blank. That's another thing. Like, uh, that's what this has over Star Trek is that uh, this is just, and especially it being about a bounty hunter, is like it is mm-hmm. not afraid to have a kill count uh, at the end of an episode. So it's it's kind of nice to have someone like Toro Calican just sort of get like knocked on his ass when he thought he like <laughs> had one over and he thought he was going to, you know, take everything, and he gets robbed afterwards. Right. As a result. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it it was really stupid of him, like Toro, because it's just like he's already admitted. He's basically a rookie. He's never done mm-hmm. anything. You've seen Mando take two, maybe three shots, you know, to his armor, and you're like, you really think you're gonna be able to take this guy in and become a legendary? It's like, how about just get a couple, you know, bounties under your belt, you know, and get some confidence, then go back and try to get Mando. But no, you do the dumbest thing possible. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. He's like his first. He wants his first head to be one of the like one of the galaxy's most wanted essentially like he is someone who has i think you bring up a good point in that this is a guy who like his 
aspirations are much larger than like his actual abilities mm-hmm. and that he's like all right i'm gonna do this if i'm gonna do this i'm gonna go hard i'm gonna you know take in some of the biggest names when it's like you need to build up a, a toolbox first before you start like saying you're gonna work on a house uh, speaking of dumb dumb decisions like can we can we say that the the mandalorian okay a not really smart with child care uh, <laughs> yeah not only does he leave the baby behind but then there's that scene where okay you're wanted for this child right and he just leads you know uh, uh pelly right outside with the child and mm. his potential killer right there it's like i realized what they were doing they were setting up but you know sometimes like as a as a I, writer I'm, I'm i'm always i'm not a writer but you know as just like seeing the writing i'm like well that was kind of dumb like wouldn't he be protective and you know yeah, there was a lot of things i thought were questionable like exactly what you're saying like even him leaving the child with uh uh amy sadaris yeah I kept thinking well he knows that the people are tracking this kid it happened on the way into the planet right it's like, it's like so i fully expected him to go to the pub and the cantina and <laughs> come back and see like his ship ablaze and everyone dead you know and the baby mm-hmm. and the baby gone uh because it's like that would make more sense and like you made a dumb decision by leaving it there and now you don't know where baby yoda is Right. It's, it's a really interesting uh, contrast to the end of last episode when they're on Sorgan, and he's like, "Great, you know, no, no docking bay, no any sort of like m- m- complicated technology. This is like purely nomadic. I can leave him here. No, here's a bounty hunter. Great. This means that like, I if I can't leave him here, I can't leave him anywhere. And yeah. then cut to the land on the planet, and he leaves him behind. It just seems <laughs> yeah. like a really odd decision given like." what he just saw i don't know maybe he was riding a high because he was able to like get his uh his kill line back from that one guy oh my who was him. yeah that that it, part also his maverick his yeah. top gun scene yeah i was gonna say like i mean good on i mean a thing that star wars is able to benefit from that that trek can't is that since it takes place in the past they can still use like the targeting graphics that were used mm-hmm. in the 70s uh mm-hmm. without it feeling like oh this like why aren't they updated the technology but yeah that was a weird place to start the episode wasn't it yeah, and I mean, and I'm I'm a fan of of Dave Filoni. This one was written and directed by him, um, and there were there were a few things in, about the episode that I just was like, oh, okay, you know, it is just not the strongest of of what we've had so far, and some some things that I I, I still enjoyed it. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong, like it is it is a it is a half an hour or forty minutes that I look forward to every Friday. I'm just like, all right. You know, you know, this has just been a, a really great candy bar to unwrap. But, uh, you know, you can still kind of be like, OK, I've had too much of this or this got a little bit cheesy on me. So. Yeah, well, this this was the first episode not written by Favreau, right? Right. I mean, it was just it just straight up said uh, written by Filoni. Yeah. So I, I wonder how much that also had an effect on things and that it does. It did feel like those first four episodes sort of had a flow to them in terms of a, a series of events that I wonder can be a credit to the fact that it was the same writer. I feel like that always happens on shows when you change writers is like even when they're working on the show, they have a different take on the characters. And so mm-hmm. maybe when we're talking about some like resets in terms of the way Mando is sort of looking at the situation, maybe we can sort of blame it on that, that it in changing the guard between writers, maybe some things sort of got fumbled or reversed. Regardless of when though, he, he has, no regard to money though like he wants money but he just gives it away like he's not a good saver either so like baby care money like these are things that are not good in a if if he's trying to get a a, a mate you know or- <laughs> i don't know they seem pretty close to one uh last week i also wonder uh if he wanted to really pay pelly off a lot of credits because like he wanted to pay her off you know being like oh, hey sure just don't if anybody comes by and asks like hey was a mandalorian coming through here with a kid like if you don't want to say anything <laughs> that'd be great that i assume that was a little note that was in with yeah mind. exactly <laughs> he's a man of few words so um so uh other any other thoughts um things that we've missed um you know about this episode uh takedowns on on scenes you know um, Some, something I want to bring up that I don't know if you guys have brought up, but something that I have really, really enjoyed about this show are the end credits. Uh, oh, yeah. for, those, for those who might not, you know, who, who tune out before then or have Disney Plus, like, 
can, you know, does the automatically play next, but they play most of the end credits over animated drawings, uh, sketches of events from the episode. Mm. And I think that is awesome. I don't know who's responsible for drawing those. Matt, I'd love to hear your opinions, especially uh, like of just like, I, I think it's a really, really cool yeah. way to end things to sort of like recap the episode, but from a very different artistic medium. Right. Well, and it pulls in, um, I mean, I know they're not Ralph McQuarrie, but it, it definitely harkens back to the, that feel of those Ralph McQuarrie stills, you know, because those those images that kind of created Star Wars, I mean, you know, fans have, have poured over those for, you know, years, decades, you know. So to kind of see see that, I, I, I do enjoy that aspect. Uh, I was enjoying the music being released as well. Um, this episode, I was kind of like, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know if there was any music in here that really kind of stood out to me, you know, but uh, still enjoy uh, Mando's theme song. So, mm. yeah, um, with the drawings, um, I don't know who's responsible for those because those are actually good art, you know, but I know that Dave Filoni is an avid sketcher. Like, he, mm-hmm. every Comic Con I've gone to where he's done a panel, he always shows uh, like an overhead projector of his sketches of, awesome. uh, of what he's his concepts are what he thinks of. That's how I knew that his ship was based off of Ventress's unused mm. ship. Cause of, uh, and what would have been the complete season six of clone wars. Ventress was going to have that ship <clears throat> that Mando is doing. And like, so I remember him showing that like, Oh, here's an unused ship design for Ventress. You know, here's, and I just, I just have that kind of memory. I'm like, Oh, like that's it. You know? And mm-hmm. you can see like his just notebook, just full of sketches. He comes up with constant of just ideas. So you wonder like if that's his influence in that, just saying like, Oh, like here's someone flesh out this, you know, pencil drawing that I've done of this, you know? I I also wonder like uh, characters from rebels that he's created, like, will we see them or will, will he slowly introduce them at all Um, Mm. or not at all? I mean, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to connect to rebels, but we've got a little cat. We got a loath cat, and if Sabine shows up, that's you know she she wears Mandalorian armor as well. I I but. really think Sabine will show up. Uh, you know I I don't know if it'll be in, not till season three or something, but sure. uh, I, I think we'll get a Sabine. It just makes it's, sense too. Yeah. You know. Can I can I ask because uh, I am you know someone who unfortunately you know I, I want to look at the EU stuff and like the other TV series, but they're so much that i i really don't know where to start i know you've mentioned clone wars and you mentioned rebels do you guys have like a recommendation because i'm interested in obviously like this has sort of reinvigorated my interest in the in the universe of it all but like where is a good place to start for someone who's looking to take a deeper dive into this material well so nick and i have two different takes on that nick go ahead wait wait on what exactly where to start like because i think you're you're kind of like if you can get your hands on it start with the old school clone yeah, wars that are, yeah. but that's not on disney plus it's um, not on disney Plus. it's no longer yeah. canon so you have to you, you can still get them on ebay like the original <clears throat> 2003 to 2005 cartoon network clone wars series mm. start there <laughs> this is where i this is when i met dave Filoni. this is what i yelled at him about because <laughs> <laughs> i i am a fan of the original cartoon network series you watch that whole first disc and then you watch the first episode of season two, mm-hmm. then start with the uh, with the canon Clone Wars series, and then once that's done, finish the Cartoon Network uh, version. Oh yeah, we want a little like machete order for this. Yeah, <laughs> and you, if once you watch it, you'll understand why I say do it that way. Mm. But uh, there also is a, an actual very interesting theory about the Clone Wars cartoons, and that the original one I'm talking about, the Cartoon Network one, that's actually what happened because it's very grim. It's very like you know, you see Grievous come down, actually kill Jedi. You know, you see it's it's a true what people say is a mm. true account of the Clone Wars. Whereas uh, the canon Clone Wars that Dave Filoni did is very propaganda esque, and that mm. every episode opens up with you know today on Tatooine, blah, blah blah blah. Like it's very like newsreel from the forties, and mm. it's all very Republic centric, and that it's always good for the Republic. You don't see uh. any separatist victories not really you know if it is, if there is an episode of a, a separatist victory it's a it's a tie into another episode where eventually the republic wins oh. and so that's that's where you kind of go oh they, they you can totally believe that this might be just a spin on how 
I mean, it's, it's just an interesting theory. You don't have to yeah. take that as truth, but it's it's an interesting way. But that's that's how I choose to watch the Clone Wars. And you actually, because the Clone Wars never got a proper ending until hopefully February. There's some books that definitely came out. The uh, the Dark Disciple book um, that uh, finishes up uh, Ventress's storyline is very good. Uh, mm. And so, like, there's things that after you finish the Clone Wars cartoons, you need to read some supplemental things just to kind of round out the story. Okay. Um, and and I'm I'm more partial to to Rebels. Like, mm. even if you haven't seen Clone Wars, even though it does, there's some things that come up. I feel like that's still easy enough to to kind of digest. Um, mm. The as I mentioned earlier, like I think the first season of both shows feel a little bit more kid oriented and as if they're kind of casting the widest net possible. I mean, that's fine. Again, as a star Trek fan, you know that like the first season, especially even the first two seasons of like any star Trek uh, yeah. franchise or, or a se- series are like not, not the best. So I'm always used to franchises, like taking some time to get ramped up. Yeah. And I think that's where I, I, I mean, it's still probably my favorite of, of the TV you know, uh, mm. cartoons is the the end of season two. Uh, Rebels uh, uh, is just so satisfying. The the that two part episode, Clone Wars for me, where I get lost is that I always feel like, even though I've seen every episode, I'm always like, have I seen this one? I can't remember. You know, because they always start off with this news reel. reel it was like last time we met, you know, left off, and it's like, wait. Did I miss something? <laughs> well, and, not, uh, yeah. There actually is a book out there on how to watch them because they're not chronologically. Oh, yeah, um, it, it's real. Oh, released. that's oh, that's interesting. Was yeah. it, is it just that like different writers get their hands on it and like oh I want to write about when this happened before you know? Well, it also has to do with the movie because there was a movie that they made. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, and the cartoon movie is somewhere in the middle of season one and two, if I, right. if I remember correctly. Yeah. There is a book that tells um, you, because like uh, the first, I forget like what the, actually the first chronologic episode is, but it's like episode 10 of season one is actually the, the actually, if you watch them in order and how they did the inner chronological Right. Time, so it's like, it's basically be, like chronologically lost, but for the Clone Wars. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's good. Um, and then, but uh, what I yelled at Dave Filoni about is kind of like that. Cause like the movie, that came out in 2008 starts off as Anakin already being a Jedi Knight and he gets his Padawan and Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, what the hell, you know, (laughs) episode two left us as him still being a Padawan. So like, how did all of a sudden he become a Jedi Knight and what makes him be able to have a, uh, a Padawan? Like that doesn't make sense. Uh, And that's why I say start with that cartoon network one, because in the cartoon network when he still is a Padawan at the beginning of it. And at the very uh, first episode of uh, season two, he becomes a Jedi Knight. Okay. So that's why I say view it that way. Cause it gives it a much, and you've also seen his first confrontation with Ventress in that cartoon network season one. Mm. So it, it sets it up better when you get into season one of the clone wars of why there's hostility there between him and Ventress. Okay, so it sort of fills in the blanks. In it does. Terms of like, it fills in the blanks. And that's, so what that, that's what I yelled at him. I was like, look, I was like, you know, Dave, the way you started it, you don't see Anakin become a, you know, a Jedi Knight. You don't see why he gets his scar. There's so many things. He kind of looks at me and goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know like, I mean, he, he, he totally, because I mean, Star Wars geeks know. I mean, he was really great about it. He's like, yeah, I know. He goes, I wanted to start it there, but Lucas didn't want to. And so I didn't really have a choice. And I'm like, okay, that explains it. So. <laughs> Like and this is up. before Lucas just like gave away control of yeah. anything Star Wars. Yeah, this was Comic Con 2009, I think. Nine or 10. And, oh, okay. And really, uh, I think it was what, 2012 when he sold um, Lucasfilm, right? Or uh, Yeah, that's rough, rough around that time. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I think there was like about a, a year's left worth of Clone Wars, and it just kind of completely truncated that. Yeah. Um, mm. And stopped it from happening. That's why they have the the final season coming back in February, which well, that's Disney. good. Yeah, I mean that's the thing is that the the Disney stuff. I know that like from a Marvel perspective, like there was the whole uh, X Men movie that a number of X Men movies that just like got completely canned that were in development. So like 
Disney's uh, putting a stop to everything, but I'm glad that at least it's it's going to see the light of day. I don't think I'll be able to get through Clone Wars before I, I get to that, obviously. But it's good to know that at least there's going to be some more content coming. But this has been super illuminating. Uh, it's good to know that there's like a couple of series to really invest in if you're looking for like especially more like digestible Star Wars mm-hmm. content. Uh, just sort of like again, little bite sized like half an hour to hour shows that you can just you know it, watch what the, you want. What I what I really fell in love with. Star Wars Rebels and why I, I feel it's better <laughs> is that there's more of a family unit that That's you true. follow, um, mm. whereas Clone Wars is a little bit more. I mean, I, I think I, you get a big, big, you get a broader scope of the universe through Clone Wars, and it really is almost kind of like the encyclopedia of of all things Star Wars. Whereas Rebels is like very yeah. much of that time period leading up to A New Hope. And deals with this this core family and kind of like their mm. troubles. Absolutely, I, I agree. Like, I mean, Rebels has like a Firefly feel to it. I mean, it's not Firefly, oh, interesting, but, but it has that. It's a family unit, and that it's a crew, and you're following this crew. And definitely, there is some side stories that you know they're in there, but there's there's other things going on. Whereas in the Clone Wars, is exactly what it is. It's it's little episodes and how you would follow a war. You know, and mm. so you're getting an episode about just clone troopers. You're getting episodes, you know, certain things like that. And it's also very borrowed from from actual war in you know american, oh, awesome. american history because like there's one i think it's in season one or it might be early season two or, uh, correct me matt if i'm wrong but it's it's, it's uh grievous's uh tra- do it's either two episodes or three episodes the, the mal malvescence malvescence is his ship and he has this this battle command ship that has a huge ion cannon on it that basically he's knocking out entire fleets with this thing and they don't know what's going on because he's slaughtering mm-hmm. everybody that's based off of um, the Sink the Bismarck, which is you know mm. a World War II battle. You know, whereas in the you know the Nazis released this huge battleship, and you know just took the the British uh, uh, Navy by uh, they sent them into a panic, and that's exactly right. what this is based off of. You can tell it is. I mean, if you know history, that's awesome. That's really interesting. So, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I like them both. They're both good. I mean, and Matt is absolutely correct. We've definitely agreed on this that the first seasons for both of those shows. Or it's just something you have to be patient with. Um, because there's definitely, you know, when you get those episodes where it's like, look, there's a little village and they need our help. And like yeah. nothing happens. And like, you're just like, now you're free. And then like, it didn't progress the story at all. You're like, okay, mm. that was like, that was a kid episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, and to that point, I mean, I, I do wonder about Mandalorian and like kind of the longevity of, of this show. Is that why we're getting these like little filler episodic yeah. kind of like moments and eventually we're going to come back to the main main story thread. That's that's a great question because uh I, you know I I does feel like to your point that the first 3 episodes were really tied together and I haven't looked at you know who's writing the last 3 episodes but I would not be surprised to be quite honest if it was like a three part ender. You know if like maybe the part 1 does end with Baby Yoda actually getting kidnapped and like it's staying that way. Maybe part 2 is is him you know coming face to face with somebody or, or someone you know a, he meets up again with uh, with carl weathers and then part three is like the big conclusion of it all so then it's it sort of is again if we're talking about casting a wide net it's also casting a wide net in terms of styles and sort of gauging the audience as to like which works better for you does this more uh you know arc long season long arc the more again to make star trek references are we going for more of a deep space nine or are we going for more of a next generation type of uh, of looking at the episodes that actually is a very good idea, though, as in if you don't want to have the series just be about Baby Yoda and Mando, for him to be kidnapped at the end of this or taken, you know, just uh, some mm. bounty hunter actually getting him uh, at the end of this season and then him not really being season two, uh, just Mando trying to find him again. And that way you could have other episodes being more but, Mandalorian centric. And if they wrote it that way. Fair enough, but oh wow. my gosh, like the outcry! Oh yeah, oh, you know it. <laughs> I mean, the, there's kids that just watch it for like they're just waiting for for Baby Yoda to show up. I, I can't control what my kids do, but it's like oh my gosh, like I can't believe that this. I mean, it's real. Like this, this, it's got legs. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm looking right now. So episode six, uh, directed by Rick Fama, uh, Famayua, story by Christopher Yost, teleplay by Christopher Yost and, and Rick Famayua. But episode seven and eight are both written by Favreau. So I okay. guess if you're looking for if there's any chance of a finale, it's probably going to be a two part finale between episode seven and eight. If we have Favreau working on them both. 
and and that would make sense too because I think uh, episode seven is the one that's going to come out Wednesday, and then you're going to have like kind of wait basically ten days until mm-hmm. you get that that you know conclusion. Uh, I assume a conclusion in episode eight. So um, I do hope that all of these characters are are just not one off characters. I do hope that we kind of see. Um, Cara Dune's character again at some point. It would it would be nice to to know that these these characters are not just. I think that that would be the one place that I think casual fans or nerdy fans alike. Like I think that's the one thing that we're all kind of wondering. Like how much of these characters are we getting because of all the promotional stuff that you see. Yeah. Wait, she was just in one episode. How can she have a Lego figure? I think if there's a character that's guaranteed to return, I I think I mentioned him before, but I think uh, you know Carl Weathers, Grief oh, Karga. Yeah. Yes. Considering that we had that thing of like, oh, I wasn't shot; it was the best car. You know, you guys <laughs> talked about like, did he mean to shoot him there? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think I think there's a non-zero chance that Werner Herzog makes an appearance at least once more in season one. Considering that like he at this point seems to be the big bad. Uh, I know that it seems like he is working for somebody else, but it does seem like he's the one who like wants to harvest Baby Yoda the most from what we're seeing. <laughs> and so I, I think it would make sense for them to like run into him at some point and that he's the one that's like going to be the one to really face down with them. Obviously not through firefight at all, but maybe more so, you know, flexing his muscles considering the stormtroopers he had around him previous. I think they just put up like one of those like little box traps with a little bowl that says bone broth. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you need. Yeah, like a um, meme fodder basically and yeah. it's like great, let me get in there. <laughs> okay. Um we've we've covered a lot with you Mike and uh I as much as I would love to talk Star Wars for another hour, I I, I like to kind of keep our our show to a healthy portion, mm. but, you know, one that you're not going to feel so stuffed when you when you listen to this podcast um any any last thoughts though before we we round off the show uh, no i mean we we talked about how this was a really interesting episode in the the scheme of things uh and so you know i'm hopeful again i i think as much as we nitpick things as much as we take a page out of nick's book uh (laughs) I, i i i like this episode i like this series in general like you said matt i think it's like a really fun thing to watch with the family on a Friday where like everyone can find something fun. And I, I enjoyed even uh, the last episode. Like you said, I really think the episode took off quite literally when they took off on the speeders uh, in the Dune Sea. That's like when it really hit a really interesting level. So, you know, whether or not Boba Fett's coming back, whether or not Baby Yoda gets kidnapped, I think that the show has tonally and from a medium perspective told a star Wars story in such a unique way that I have really enjoyed the risks that they've taken. And I hope they keep taking risks and I'm hopeful that they'll keep taking risks, even if it's more so in a season two than a season one, but can't wait to see what happens. And I can't wait to keep digging in with you guys listening along as you cover the last few episodes and the movie as well. Yeah. Thanks Mike. And, uh, Mike, where can people find anything else with, with you, with your name on it? I mean, you are a man of many words, I know. Yes, uh, both v- vocally and I guess uh, from a writing perspective. So you can find everything I do on uh, my social media. My Twitter and Instagram is at a Mike Bloom type. Uh, from a, I'm a journalist. I write for Parade.com. I mainly cover reality shows there. So right now I'm covering Survivor. Uh, which is currently in its season. I'm doing Exit Press and doing some other articles for that, as well as a Survivor podcast for Rob Has a Podcast. Uh, The other big project that I've been working on is I have been doing a Lost Rewatch, not the Lost Rewatch that's linked with Jack, uh, (laughs) even though... So I do a podcast called Down the Hatch, a Lost Rewatch podcast with a great guy, a reporter for The Hollywood Reporter, Josh Wiggler. Every week, we put out a three-hour podcast that takes a look wow. into an episode of Lost. Uh, right now, we are up to... Actually, we are getting into the infamous Numbers episode. Uh, we come out on Fridays. Look at it in your podcatcher of choice. It has been some of the most fulfilling and fun work I've ever done podcasting. Lost is a show that I love so near and dear. And getting to Im- reinvestigate everything with you know uh, the gift of hindsight and just getting so granular, especially in that first season, which is just so magical, has been a really, really good time. And Josh and I were also on Jack's rewatch for uh, Exodus, which is my favorite episode of Lost. And we'll be talking about that next month. But be sure to check that out. Those are the main two projects I'm working on. I, I write some other stuff here and there, but 
I basically pimp out everything I do uh, on social media. So if I do any other stuff in between, I'll be sure to, to publicize it there. Great. No, that's, that's awesome. Um, Nick, uh, any, any, any thoughts about the, this episode before we move on or you, you're, you're good. Um, I do have one thing that we didn't bring up. I just thought it was, it, we can just kind of, no, it's anything, anything's fair game. Yeah. Um, there was one interesting thing I th- I thought it was a small detail, but it's it's about the Tuscan Raiders and that because we didn't really talk about it, that it kind of changed canon a little bit in the fact that in A New Hope and in Attack of the Clones, they've we've always known them just as kind of barbarians, mindless people who don't know what they're doing, mm-hmm. and then in this episode, we see them actually have their own language and that they want to trade, and and so you're kind of like oh, like this kind of gave them more depth, I guess. Yeah, I'm just I'm just was very confused that when they left, they didn't come back in more numbers because that's like <laughs> literally all I know about sand people at this point. <laughs> right. I I thought they weren't dirty enough. Like I mm. like when, when that shot, they were so clean that it kind of it was. I didn't mind the way that they appeared and it was kind of like spooked them. And I and I actually liked the fact that the Mandalorian. We don't know what he conveyed. Like we're told what he conveyed, but I like the idea that maybe he just took his binox away because then Mando, the Mando is the one with the best optics. Yeah, that's true as well. That like he had, uh, he had the leverage in that he was sort of like the go between between the Tuscan Raiders and Toro. Right. So like he could essentially, he's the one that's negotiating. And so he's like, Hey, you know what? Let me like knock this kid down a few pegs. He just smashed that fob. So I'm going to smash something of his. Yeah. Kind of, you know, yeah, I wonder if it actually was sign language or was it just something like, oh, move your hands around, you know? Like, yeah, it- I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I know that. So uh, my mother-in-law studied sign language in college and my wife knows a bit of sign language. And I think if it was actual ASL, she would have like, be like, oh my God, it's actual ASL. It more so seemed like uh, umpire signals than okay. it did actual like sign language. Or if you've watched any talking head uh, video. Um, it was same as it ever was. I, I swear he does that motion. Um, anyway, uh, no, thanks for mentioning the, the, the Tuscan Raiders because I, uh, I had had that kind of one moment where I was like, they seem kind of clean. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, um, lots of other like little, little nuggets. I think, uh, Nick and I just kind of listed all of them off. Um, we got a little, call out we know that the planet that he was on was on navarro Navarro, that was that was the one Mm. fine finally confirmed um do we think dave navarro will make it a guest appearance (laughs) at some point as like the chancellor of navarro he's just king he just sits there you know i like that um but you know who is king though is those patrons that make this show possible they rule the galaxy um with an ironclad fist uh Ways that you can help out this show. You can uh, rate, review us on iTunes. Uh, that always, that always, we always appreciate that. Um, we are part of the Jan Jack network. So that means if you go to amazon.com slash Jan Jack, I believe is, is the, the, uh, the affiliate link there. Anything that you buy through that Amazon affiliate link helps all the podcasters out on the network. We appreciate that. Uh, to become a patron, go to patreon.com. Or just jnjack.com. Or just jnjack.com. Uh, you can get the link there. Uh, become a patron um, at $1 or, as Jack puts it, a million dollars. But, you know, we're not greedy. Uh, for those patrons that, that do support us, not at the million-dollar level, but uh, at a significant amount to get their names mentioned on the show, I'd like to thank them now. Uh, Tack from Tatooine. Eckhart from... Uh, Wait, I had I had new ones written down. Where oh I? no! Oh no! Yeah. Oh, here it I was going to say, did we we visit a tax uh, home base this episode? Right. Yeah. Thanks, Tack. Uh, Tack from Tatooine, Eckhart Rich, Richter from Ryloth, Maggie from Malakor, Ed from Endor, Drake from Duntooine, and Joanne from Geonosis. So, little little alliteration there for all of our patrons that make this show possible. We appreciate it. Um, and thanks again, Mike, for joining us uh, for this podcast. Yeah. Nick. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Mike. And uh, my name's Matt. Uh, great show, guys. One yeah. in uh, Tatooine. So. <laughs> That's going to be two. Uh, yeah, see you guys. <laughs> <laughs>